All right, well, let's, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. So what do you think, human beings? Wow. Huh. How many people have been to other events in the last, uh, I don't know, in the last few months? Anybody? OK. So Paul and I have t had the chance. We've been, our, our group's been at three of them in the last, what, five weeks or something. So it's really good. People are coming back. Essential part of our business talking with each other. So hopefully we'll actually have some communication in both directions here um, and have some questions. So uh, my name's Sean Petsy and uh, I want to talk about uh, this subject here of uh, bringing together all the different types of data sources and the value that we can get by uh, combining them together to support uh, commissioning process M&V and uh, identifying and validating or verifying uh, energy conservation measures and their results. So. Um, Again, as everyone knows here, this was all uh, uh, submitted so you can get your uh, continuing education units. So, and uh, we've provided all the information. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead uh, from these slides. These are all available to you if you download the, uh, the material. Uh, but the things we want to talk about here today and hopefully impart to everybody is uh, understand the important role that uh, data analytics and this new generation of software tools that I'm sure you're seeing a lot of out, out there on the floor, how they're affecting uh, the processes and job of energy analysts and m and professionals. Um, understand the benefits and when you can combine the different datas, uh, data types together and talk about data visualization, which is actually one of, you know, we find one of the biggest revelations and uh, that people get when they finally are using these types of tools is to see their data and then talk about key performance indicators and then we want to talk about the challenges because you know it's not all roses and easy so we want to be very real about what's involved in doing these things so so with that data right you know Data is fundamental to what we're doing as professionals in energy engineering and M and V. And one of the challenges is we're seeing more and more data sources, you know, available to us. Right? That it, in some ways you could say it's almost exploding. I think that's a little exaggeration, but you have more data sources coming at you than you did before, right? Utility companies are making the meter data available in different ways. You've got different types of systems going into buildings, IoT devices, separate metering systems, BAS systems, all of these things, which are good, but also create a big part of the challenge of working with data, right? Is how we're gonna integrate all of them and uh, how we're gonna combine them together to get the maximum value out of things, right? Kind of like our, maybe, you know, make an analogy, our five senses are coming together, right? We do more if all of our five senses are working together well. We can do more if we can bring all these different data sources together. So, okay. So, transforming. That's one of the main things we do when we're working with data is we actually do what software engineers call transform the data, right? Because you got this raw data that human beings aren't good with. We want to transform it. We want to transform at a simple level, we want to transform our meter data into charts and graphs. We want to add some math to it and calculate KPIs, right? We want to uh, correlate. We want to see what's happening with different data types or data sources at the same time because we want to get to the, the end result, which is detect patterns and trends, how equipment use is affecting energy use, and uh, you know, then hopefully get to automated fault detection right? Detecting problems in building systems that we can all bring to the owners and operators to help them meet their goals and hopefully save money, right? So I want to talk the first thing about what is often the end result of using data analytics, which is detecting patterns, right? And people talk about fault detection and diagnostics. It's an easy way to talk about it. But when we boil it down, what we're really talking about is using software techniques to detect patterns in data. And an interesting thing, you know, patterns can form in a minute, you know, if you have that uh, resolution of data, or it might take an entire day or even longer to say, here's our pattern. Think about slow loss of efficiency in HVAC equipment heat exchangers, you know. You can look at it now and in an hour, you're not going to see it most likely. You look at it now over the past two months, aha, now we see a trend, right? So when we think about fault detection, one of the things I like to point out is fault detection isn't an alarm, it's a pattern that is important to us in one way or another, okay? So it's beyond alarms, you can, you know, certainly alarms are an example of it, but the real value here is being able to detect patterns in our data over, over time, 
right? Um, by combining them together, we might see that actually the uh, heat exchanger didn't lose efficiency, something else upstream happened, and that's why we're not getting what we expect out of the heat exchanger. Well, we had to combine data from different things. If we just looked at the heat exchanger, we might make the wrong, draw the wrong final conclusion, right? Um, but these patterns are going to relate to a number of things. They're either going to relate to cost, right, so we can save money, or they're going to relate to efficiency or comfort, perf uh, overall performance of our systems, or financial results, right, that we, many of the professionals in the room here, right, you're, you're hired to validate projects, validate ECMs, et cetera, right? So for a lot of the people you might communicate with, the only thing they care about are the financial results. They don't care about the patterns or, or uh, the KPIs or anything. All right, so when we look at patterns, this is one example of a way to look at patterns that come from our, our software. We're seeing timelines indicating when certain things are happening, when events or behaviors are happening. And it's most often associated with fault detection, but actually we're seeing that uh, this can be used in the exact opposite way. You can have a, a pattern that proves everything's okay, right? The green light, I see the pattern, hey, everything's fine. I'm getting the air exchanges I expect. I'm staying within the demand range that I expect, whatever, right? Because there's certain people, that's what they want to consume. They're not looking to consume just a fault, right? All right, but these are different ways we can look at, at the patterns detected in equipment systems. The idea of timelines, most of the stuff that's happening in buildings is considered a timeline, time series, right? All right, so now let's talk about combining or correlating data from different sources, right? This is one of the things that um, this whole new age of analytic software makes not only possible, but dramatically easier than it's ever been, right? Because if we can combine data from different systems, we can see relationships that might not have been obvious looking at just one of the systems, right? I mean, one of the most ex simple examples we're going to come to is weather, right? We'll look at that next, right? But if we can combine both of them together, then we can do a smarter job with fault detection rules because we can say, yeah, I'm seeing this behavior, but I also know this is happening. So it's, it's actually okay. Um, Let's, let's look at one where we combine weather, right? So here what we're looking at is a, the weather, but a pattern, right? So the pattern we're seeing here in, in the yellow here is you know, when the building is occupied, right? And we're seeing our energy pattern, and we're seeing our weather. Well, the first thing we can see is you know, that the energy appears to be related to uh, the uh, oh, in fact, I'm sorry, the yellow is sunrise. We're seeing our pattern of demand, right? Kind of looks like a building that's following a schedule, right? Overnight, it's low, it shoots up, it drops down. And we're also seeing weather, we might in, you know, see a, visually see a correlation between you know, when the temperature goes up, the demand goes up, right? And this is one of the key, key benefits of analytics, is just seeing your data and seeing them combined together in, in different ways. So that's one of the first things that we can look for. But Obviously, we're probably going to go further than that. So now, you know, we could look at, let's do some real analysis. Let's not just look at those two charts and say, hmm, I think they're correlated. Let's use some math, right? Let's do a regression analysis and get a scatter plot and a slope of a line, right? And so here we're just looking at that, where we are now doing a regression analysis between the uh, outside air temperature, right, and the KW. H consumption that's being used in the building, right? Could you do all this with pencil and paper or Excel? And the answer is all of these things have been able to be done one way or another. The, the challenge and the opportunity presented with analytics is we can do it faster, easier, more cost effectively, and really use these tools more widely to help um, the work we do for building owners and operators. So, all right. So now let's talk about taking it to the next step, which is, you know, how are we going to report and do energy analysis? Right. So, you know, some examples we have here are showing what, what can be done here is one of the first things we want to do is we saw, you know, look at our energy curve, in this case demand, but then we want to normalize it, right? Do we want to normalize it for what? Well, the most common thing, right, is degree days, right? But we want to get more precise, you can get down to degree hours. And, but then we, want to compare that against industry benchmarks or baselines or even internal corporate goals. We often see that you may 
have a, a building, and yeah, there's an industry benchmark. Buildings of this type typically perform along this curve. But the organization has a goal to do better. So I want to compare it against multiple things, right? And then we need to normalize for other factors, whether it's not the only thing, right, that we might want to normalize. Size of the building, um, it, some occupancy, um, restaurant chains, we want to normalize based on maybe revenue per site, because you know, you don't want to say this revenue's, an, uh, this restaurant's an energy hog when it's a busy one and we're comparing against one that's not busy. Right? So those are ways we can, com uh, we can now, combining weather data, do normalization, combining baselines, and do benchmarking. Interesting thing about benchmarks are usually, you know, here's the benchmark for a certain type of building. We're seeing an increased use of take the energy model information, what the building design is expected to perform, use that as a benchmark or baseline, because the goal we want to see is, are we meeting the design, right? or how far off of the design we are. So the model data, which is an output, with charts a graph can be brought into the analytics software and compared to the actual, which is coming from meters, submeters, smart meters, uh, web service feeds from utility companies. You get the idea, a lot of different data sources, right? All right, so we'll continue on our conversation about energy and utilities and talk about a, a really interesting uh, thing that we can do, which is to now bring in tariff rate data. So it's in, when, it, when we talk about this in different places around the country, sometimes a lot of people completely have no interest in this, which is interesting. So I, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you are doing projects for customers who are in uh, utility territories where there are complex tariff rates? Okay, but it's not everybody, which I, I, I found that to be interesting because the different regions have different things. But if you do have sophisticated tariff rates, wow, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the questions we ask is, could you, you know, use more energy and it costs less in certain tariff rate structures? The answer is yes, you could, right? All right, so now we get two very different types of information if you think about it, right? Tariff rate is a whole series of charges, right? We might have uh, generation, transmission, distribution, consumption, demand, time of day, time of year, block range, service charges, taxes, minimums, all of these types of things, right? Um, I'm sure everybody's heard, you know, there's over 30,000 tariff rates in the US alone, right? But it's a very different type of data. It's not a sensor value. So what does software allow us to combine the two things together, right? So in our example here, we've got line graphs showing our uh, consumption and demand, and then bar graphs showing our cost with the different colors representing the different chargers. We had a simple example here where we basically have three charges. We've got consumption um, and demand, um, and uh, let's see, consumption, demand, and demand peak, so you get three chargers there, okay? And uh, th this is proved to be a really effective in a lot of areas because this might be the first thing that you present to an owner is, we've looked at your meter data and did you know this is how it's affecting what you're paying? Oftentimes that may get the attention that, wow, we, we ought to look at that. And it might be simply, yeah, you're on the wrong rate. It was a good rate when you signed up for it four years ago. Not so good anymore, or there's better rates. So you can do the what if analysis, compare, different tariff structures to your exact uh, actual energy historical use, interval meter use, or your design that came out of the model, or both, right? Hey, if the building really did work as designed, this would be a good rate. One minor problem, it doesn't, right? So not, not the best rate to be on, right? All right, and you know, some of the questions you ask, could you end up paying more for using less energy? That can happen. Could you pay less and not even reduce energy? And uh, you know, historically, and I, I've been doing this for 30 plus years. Historically, you know, the quick calculation: well, oh, what's the cost per kWh? You know, very that can be very deceiving and like virtually useless, right? For depending on what type of tariff structure you're under. Okay. Um, so, and the other thing is, it's very hard to do manually. It can be done, but. So here are some of the charges we see out there. Um, you know, consumption, demand, time of day, service, equipment, 
generation, minimum, ratchets, custom uh, charges, uh, you know, the custom rate uh, uh, structure that you've now negotiated with if you're a large commercial um, client. I got a good one though, because when we were when we were doing the software, I think this this was really fascinating. We tried to talk to the whole world, and we got tariff rate structures from Oceania and Australia and Europe. And we're talking to people in Europe. We're talking to guys from Spain, and of course, you know, a little bit of a language barrier. And uh, I said, "Yeah, you gave us this, this, your rate structure, but this, you know, this rate structure showed it it ends at whatever it was, 50 kW. You know, what's the structure? No, no charge." Really? So if I use one? No. There's a breaker panel and the utility shuts you off. And that was a commercial rate in Spain. So there really was no charge above 50 kW. They just shut the building off on you. Right. It's a true story. I couldn't believe it. It took numerous calls to make sure we were communicating effectively. So anyways. Okay. All right. So when you end up with this, what, what happens, right? Well. You have this complex tariff rate, right? That, first of all, one of the interesting things is it might itself be based on historical data, right? If it's time of year, you're going to have a whole historical record. So, this type of stuff, you know, you don't do with a calculator, right? Um, so, you have to point to the structure, which may include a historical change in costs over time, and then assign it to the meter. And that's why we have software to do all of that type of stuff to uh, connect it together. So. All right, so one of the next topics we want to talk about that I believe is uh, pretty timely, but I want to get some uh, audience feedback on that, is um, greenhouse gas, right? So as I said, I've been, I've been doing this for 35 plus years. There's, it looks like there's a bunch of people in the room who've also been doing it about that long. Either that or you decided late in your career to come to this industry. Um, so. As I, as I remember it, this is like the fourth time in my career that energy mattered. <laughs> I got some heads nodding, right? So we had to take a, bit, a bet. You think it's going to stick this time? <laughs> well, there's a possibility that this might actually be one of the reasons, because now there's a different perspective on it, right? It isn't we should save energy because we should save some money. It's there's another societal factor pushing us, right, to reduce our impact on the environment. And the, I think one of the interesting things about this that we've seen is we're ending up talking to different people in an organization. We're talking to the C-suite, the financial people, the people worried about the annual reports, the people worried about reporting, not just the people paying the bills and worried about whether the HVAC system is running well. So I don't know, maybe it'll stick this time? I see some hands nodding. That's good, positive attitude. All right, anyways. So how do you get GHG data? Well, you, you, we got to talk about the different scopes. So let's see, here's a skip ahead here. You know, scope one and scope two, probably everybody in this room knows it, but always have this in the educational uh, presentation, right? The scope uh, two is what's considered indirect, right? Which is that you're purchasing it from the utility company, where scope one would be, you know, you're burning propane or natural gas or oil on site, right? But both of them, in the end, are metered energy resources, right? So it all boils down to you have meter data. Hey, that's kind of where we started the conversation. So you have meter data, and with the meter data, you can quickly convert it to greenhouse gas data with just one other piece of information, which is the conversion factor, right? And uh, the EPA has a great uh, online service called eGrid where you can actually type in a um, zip code and get the recognized conversion factor for your area by your utility company based on their blended, you know, what they deliver in whatever combination of um, renewable or non-renewable energy they have. And then there's commercial services out there that'll give you actually down to the interval, um, you know, what a utility company is burning to send you the energy. So you can actually, now you have another whole time series data stream. It isn't a constant for, you know, Richmond, Virginia. It is a trend every 15 minutes for Richmond, Virginia, depending on what the energy mix is. And that's becoming increasingly com common 
um, with renewable energy sources making a bigger and bigger penetration. But the EPA eGrid service is a great way to get, to get going, right? Because you can, if you've got meter data, right? And a little bit of software and you look up the conversion factor online, you get it and you click a button and all of a sudden now you have greenhouse gas equivalent data. And interestingly enough, you can get it down to the same resolution as your meter data, right? I think a lot of GHG reporting started off with the monthly or the yearly stuff, right? And then, I mean, this is all a journey, right, for our industry. But, you know, getting down to actually seeing what your greenhouse gas impact is on a equal to your interval meter data, you can now do that really easily, right? And that can be a great um, way for organizations to get um, the information they need, and I, and I guess I bring this up because I think this is creating a new opportunity for uh, you know all the professionals at this this meeting, right? It, to talk to another part of an organization who has new needs, right? You know, I mean, how, how many of all, us have all lived with the fact that you know when you want to go in and propose these projects, most of them is okay. So what's the ROI for doing this for me? Okay, and you spend your life calculating that, right? Okay, so now we can go into the C-suite and so what's the ROI for uh, reporting your greenhouse gas equivalents um, accurately? Well, maybe not getting a, you know, sued by the SEC if that ruling comes through where they're going to make public companies report their greenhouse gas. And then you have the whole societal thing, you know, converting it to the number of trees we'd have to plant or and grow for 10 years or the number of cell phones charged or all of those things that you know can be more meaningful depending on your audience right all that stuff click of a button with software if you have meter data okay and you know how how does the process work right you pick an emission source right that might be your uh, utility company after the you know the zip code and uh, then you pick um, the meter you want to apply it to and then you're done right so it's a great way to, uh, for all of us in this industry to start talking to that part of organizations that are caring about this other aspect of energy. So how many people here, as we asked a couple of people out, at the, out on the trade show floor, how many people here have their, are having GHG conversations with your customers? Okay, pretty, pretty good number, but not everybody again, right? Actually, we had a conversation this morning. Somebody said, yeah. We brought it up and the customers we work with actually don't care, right? So this gets into the challenge, I think, of our industry, right? Is the, uh, what do the uh, different owners and operators we're working with care about? All right, so let's talk about one, another piece of data, right? Because we often end up totally focused on the energy and the meter data, but what's driving it? Well, equipment operation. And this is where our insight really starts to happen. Right. If we can now correlate our energy performance, consumption, demand, and even costs against the equipment operation, and that, that's a, this is an example we're trying to show here. Right, we've got our energy curve. We've seen it shows a pattern that we believe looks like an occupancy schedule, up and down. But then what we have below are all of the things that affect it. You know, if you're a BAS type person, what we have below are all of the uh, Binary points, the on-off points, the the loads, etc. Right that we have here. What do we got? We have we have occupancy schedule. We have parking lot lights. We have uh, HVAC units. Hmm, interesting pattern. I see. This happens to be an HVAC unit. Both there's two of them there, right? And if you notice, and you don't need to read it. That's I think that's an interesting thing. You don't actually need to read this. You can just see an interesting pattern here, right? We're slamming on multiple stages of heating or cooling simultaneously all at once, right? Hey, well, I thought the spec said that this should be a soft start sequence. I don't need to need a lot of deep analysis to go, ah, uh -uh, there isn't a soft start sequence working there, right? Hey, that might be the difference between demand charges, right? And the building operating according to the expected budget, and it could be something as simple as that, that it either wasn't implemented where somebody went and made a minor change that killed the uh, or stopped the you know the staging program from functioning. Right. Again, how do we see that? The combination of the two types of data together that gives us this visualization. Um, 
And so much of what we see people benefiting from um, doing this is just that quick glance, right? You can see that pattern. I may have pointed out to you, but you, you don't even need to read this to go, hey, something's fishy there, right? So correlating with equipment. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about, we mentioned early on, but I want to talk about tracking and reporting of KPIs, key performance indicators, and uh, one of the most important things we can do about with them, um, which we'll talk about on the next slide, right? So, you know, what we find is data means different things to different people, right? And, uh, you know, there may be people in the organization who care about fault detection, and then there's people who don't care anything about that. They just want to know, you know, what's my KWH per square foot, my dollars per square foot, all, you know, KPIs, right? And this, you can have dozens of them depending on the organization. Again, here's a place where the software can make that all available. You set up the KPIs once, and as the meter data flows in, you have all your KPIs always available to you, right? You know, some common ones are energy use and cost per square foot or per unit of production, um, per occupancy metric, revenue generation, et cetera, right? We need to understand what's driving the energy results. We, we might care about the raw energy, but we also probably care about uh, it factored with the other things that are driving it. And data centers, uh, PUE, power use, utilization effectiveness, um, KPIs that are deltas, they compare against past periods or other um, behaviors, right, are another type of KPI. And uh, then, you know, higher level might be just the number of issues of faults. That's a KPI. How many faults are we having per hour, day, week, month, year by facility? Why do we have so many in this facility and not? Well, Mr. Owen, I told you that's because your equipment needs to be replaced. In fact, I've told you that for the last five years, but now you can see it, right? And that brings out an interesting dynamic I've seen over the years working with this is when you, when you visualize these things in a different way than just numbers in a table, it has a totally different effect on the human being who's looking at it, right? And so instead of I'm just telling you your equipment isn't working and should be replaced. We show you something that is, makes it just visually clear in another way. It's been really interesting to see the different impact it has on uh, human beings, right? Because we're all visual. So, But if I have KPIs, what do I care about, right? And I, and I relate this to the earlier comment of, you know, I can bring up a, a graphic on a BAS and I can look at it, right? I can see the valve position, the temperature, the fan spinning. <laughs> Looks okay. I'm busy. Go to next meeting. All right? What was it doing five minutes earlier, an hour earlier, over the last week, over the last month, whatever? Right? Same thing with KPIs. Hey, all my KPIs look good today. Yeah, they do, but here's your trend. This is one of the, the best things we can do with KPIs is to trend them. Now, they might be a line trend. They might be that middle one is a delta trend where the baseline is the zero line and we're seeing on a time basis, day by day, right? Site by site, that's all those different colors. We're seeing whether above, above or below our baseline goal, right? Or it might be cumulative, you know, hours of runtime, operation, total KWH, et cetera. So that's the insight we really get from KPIs is to see what they're doing over time, right? Um, you know, so. All right, let's, uh, we talked earlier about normalization, you know, and the, and the common thing is normalization for weather. But, you know, there's so many other things we might want to normalize for, as we mentioned briefly, occupancy, revenue, units of production, you know, factories, obviously, um, and then site specific. And one of the things that are important is oftentimes you have to normalize for multiples of these. It's not just one at a time, it's all of them, right? The, you know, square foot, normalize the consumption or demand by square foot, by degree days, by unit of production, right? And by other factors, all of it, right? A little bit of math, but, you know, software can make it really easy to do that and create all kinds of custom normalization. All right, so next uh, one I want to talk about is this, um, baselining analysis. You know, baselines have a, a specific meeting, uh, and then there's benchmarks, and then there's goals. But we're really talking about comparing against 
a set of data that we care about, right? It's, it's the benchmark from the industry, it's the baseline from last year, or it's the goal for next year, right? It's all you know, basically the same concept when you're talking about doing analytics, so we can compare against our baselines over any period of time. But we can also provide math. Let's compare against last year's data minus our goal, 10%, right? So we should look at our actual against our goal, which is based on what we committed to, which was we'll reduce demand or consumption by 10%. All right, and that's, that's just an example of how we can present that as well. All right, so let's get back to talking to the end customers, the C-suite, right? Financial reporting, a key thing that, um, you know, the use of analytics software and the combination of this data can really, really change, right? Is putting this information into the format that that customer that we're working with, it might be the C-suite or it might be the facility suite, right, whatever. What format do they care about? Do they want it in Excel so that they can have their financial people further process it? Okay, they want the KPIs fully normalized, but they want that in a you know, format that they can work with. So a key part of, where, you know, of what analytics can do is make all of the data, the initial raw data, but also all the calculated data, the KPIs, the trends, everything available in a, in a whole suite of open formats so that people can do other things. And I think that's one of the big things, themes we're seeing in the energy and automation industry is, you know, there's new applications developed constantly. If you have a system of the data it has should be available in a standard open way, standard open format. Right. So we're a big believer in that uh, at our company. We're um, one of the founding members and a big supporter of what's called Project Haystack. We'll talk about that in a moment. All right, so that's financial management type reporting, but then there are the people using it on a daily basis, right? And you know, this is probably one of the biggest areas of software development is you know, it's called UX, user experience. How do we make stuff intuitive to people? How do we get that message across, right? Why do my apps keep updating on my phone because somebody thought they had an easier way to present it to me and now an app I used to know how to work. I can't run anymore. Um, but anyways, the, the whole idea of that, and this is a huge area of continued investment uh, by the software world to make results more useful, help people in their workflow process, present information in, you know, bubble charts and donut charts and charts and graphs and baselines and timelines and Excel and tables and all of that because it depends what you're trying to do, right? So those are all different ways. And, uh, and then we, we wanted to talk briefly just about this, right? Getting all those formats out, right? Um, you know, PDFs are a big way we share information with each other, right? So can the software deliver everything that you see as a PDF quickly, easily? automatically send PDFs to people. You know, the whole idea of um, can you automatically send the uh, M&V report to your customer without any work, right? Well, if you set it up with software, you can actually set it up to automatically process at the end of the month and automatically email to all the people who care about it and they get it as a PDF and you're still in bed or having your coffee, right? Huge time savings and kind of workforce um, multiplier that you get out of using these new suite of tools, right, that are out there. Okay, so does everybody agree this is all wonderful? How do you make it happen, right? And uh, that's a picture of Lewis and Clark up there. And uh, I like this analogy. I happen to live, live in the city where Lewis and Clark lived, okay? Um, and uh, it's, I, I find it a fascinating story and I, I'd like to bring out a couple of things about it. Um, two things, one, there was no guaranteed ROI on their trip that they proposed that was funded. They just thought there might be something valuable out here. And they were able to convince people that there was something valuable out there. I don't quite know how they did that, but I think there's a lesson there for us in our industry. With a little bit of data, you can say, there's something valuable here. Look at how your energy rate, uh, tariff structure compares to your energy use. I think there's something valuable here. You ought to engage us to go a little further, right? All right, so what's involved on the journey here is getting the data. Now, this is the simplest part of the process. <coughs> this is the biggest part of the problem, right? And 
what we find is it's often over, uh, overlooked or underestimated, the challenge, right? So that oftentimes people say, hey, we tried to do analytics, we couldn't get anywhere with it. Really? You, the charts didn't work? Well, no, we could never get any data. Unfortunately, this is still a big part of the problem in the industry. But for more than just, uh, you know, if you will, the, ba the malintent reason, right? Yeah, there are still closed and proprietary systems that make it difficult to get data. The, pro the other problem is there's an explosion of different systems and few of them are following any single or small group of standards. So you're faced with, oh, how am I going to get data out of this? It's open. It's available. Yeah, you just need a software engineer to write an API connector to it, right? And unfortunately, this is still happening. And this brings me back to a point I mentioned earlier. We're, we're a big believer in Project Haystack. That's an open source, non-commercial uh, non um, community-driven effort to standardize how we get data and how the data is described or marked up with attributes. We call them tags, right? And you know, we've been pushing uh, that effort and recruiting people around the world for over 10 years now with, with good progress. But it's not out there everywhere. And that's when we talk about harmonizing data. But data acquisition is key. When I talk to people who are new to this, I say your first step, you don't need to open the software. You need to talk with that customer how you're going to get that data. Okay, Where is it? What protocol is it? What security barriers might exist for me to even get the data? And because of security, which is obviously a serious thing, we see a lot of projects start with just exported data. Right? Hey, Export the data f up to yesterday from the BAS. Don't try to connect out of the gate and go through thousands or more dollars of IT department stuff before you've proven the value, the case. Export the data, run the analytics on the historical data. Hey, up till the beginning of last month, look what we found for you. Here are your KPIs, whatever. Now let's go, Just we can justify working with the IT department to get a live connection. Maybe we'll never get a live connection. We see some projects, they never get a live connection. They export historical data once a day, once a week, once a month. You know what? You can still do tremendous things around all, all of these goals we've talked about, all the way to fault detection. Okay. Um, and then you get into harmonizing it. Data comes in different formats. That's where Project Haystack comes in. And then you get into what do you want to do with it. So. What's involved in applying uh, analytics to data? The first thing is, what, am, what data source is it, and how am I going to connect to it? Right? And one of the things I like to mention is it's not just the sensors. It's not just the BAS system. Right? What about just asset data that we need to know? We had a, a customer I thought it was really interesting. One of the first things they did with their meter data was compare it against type of building design. And they, this was really interesting. They learned that some of their older buildings were actually better performing than the new ones that were supposed to perform better. That was really interesting. You know, it'll, you know, now they knew something to proceed. And then you know, one, of the, one of the other things is to, you know, of course, combine it with production data. Um, type of construction, age of construction, brand of equipment. We see people doing analytics on that. All right? The buildings with brand X versus brand Y seem to have this pattern. The buildings serviced by service company A versus B seem to have this pattern. And the point there is just you know, think beyond the temperature sensor. Right? And then you're going to bring it together and you're going to give it meaning, normalize it, contextualize it, map it, tag it, wrangle it. All of those words are often used when you're doing that. And then it can get to the, the process that's going to calculate KPIs, do the baseline comparison, do the fault detection, and of course, finally, delivering the end results. So communication connectors, you know, these are just the most common ones out there, right? Of course, BACnet has become pretty much standard. Uh, Project Haystack has a software integration method, so you can get data out of a Project Haystack supported system, connecting to SQL Server databases, uh, connecting to IT equipment. You go into a data, data uh, center and lots of that equipment communicates over SNMP, not BACnet, right? Um, and then you have other protocols for industrial markets, Modbus, OPC, et cetera. A uh, new IoT protocol that's uh, you hear talked about a lot uh, is MQTT, right? Um, that, a lot of people underestimate um, 
or overestimate the simplicity. How, how about that? Let's put it that way. And then you have, do batch import in all these different, if you will, textual formats, CSV, XML, JSON, et cetera. Okay. And I want to bring up an example here. This is a good example. You know, meter data. You get the meter data, and you don't, once you have the data, you can read it, right? Well, you, we've, a lot of people have been focused on the communication protocols, right? I got BACnet, great, you got BACnet, you can connect. Do you know what, you, what it says? Do you know what it means, right? And this is actually just a simple example around meter data. Meter data comes in different formats. Here's a simple one, a CSV format. And like we could read this as human beings together, right? It might be kind of boring, but we can read it, right? But then there's all kinds of other formats. You know, here's the same format, the same exact data, exactly the same in XML. Now, a software guy on your team might go, oh, that's what I want. But when I look at it, oh, that's kind of what I wanted, right? And uh, this one down here is in JSON, a very popular new textual format the software works with, right? All of these things, I bring them up because they're all part of moving into the world of using data analytics, right? The end result, the charts and graphs are great for the energy engineer, but how do you get there, right? Well, these are part of the things on the way. And uh, this is a little more on Project Haystack, the idea of it's tagging, metadata, semantic modeling. And, you know, the way I'm, how many in here have heard of Project Haystack? Okay, all right. So, I'll do just a real quick, why does this matter? I'll try, try to get the point across. Why do we need tagging or semantic data on when we want to use data from different systems? And here's the analogy I'd make. We're human beings, right? Do you know numbers actually have no meaning? I will prove it to you. Paul, I will give you 100. Lashes? Days off. Dollars? More like flash, right? But we don't think that way because do we ever encounter, in our engineering world, do we ever encounter numbers that don't have units? Well, we probably do, but I mean, it's expected. Guess what? Units is metadata. It describes the data. The temperature, 76.2 is the data. The metadata is the units. Well, that's a simple example, but let's go further. What's it measuring? Uh, air. In what? Room seven, served by which AHU? HU two, on what schedule? Occupancy schedule five. That's metadata. Well, what Haystack does is provide a standard way to represent that. So if you follow the standard, you can, anybody could read and interpret that. Software can read and interpret it. And that's all tagging is about. In fact, I make an analogy. It's very similar to something we all use every day, which is the web, right? Back, back in the early 90s, a thing called HTML emerged, which is, hey, if we're gonna publish our stuff on the web, we maybe all ought to use a standard way to define text and bold and put an image in HTML. The web wouldn't work without a standardized metadata modeling approach, HTML. We're all struggling because our industries haven't adopted that mentality to a big enough degree. That's what Project Haystack's trying to accomplish, open source initiative to try to accomplish. All right, so the summary of why we would want to consider analytics, why we would want to bring these data sources together is really, you know, do you know what your systems are really doing, right? Hey, we had the model design, okay. It's gonna be a net zero building, okay, is it? And we get some great examples of how using analytics were the way that buildings were tuned to achieve their design, right? Because if we think about it, net zero design and a lot of these passive designs and stuff, this is new stuff and it looks good on paper and it's even achievable, but you know, maybe there'll be some uh, bugs and wrinkles when the building is uh, first commissioned or started up and hey, they didn't do, they installed the dampers the way we told them to. They didn't do that the way they, um, all of these sensors, there's a whole bunch of them that aren't working. So that's a key area we see where you get some really good examples of the results with analytics. So I'll stop there. I'll be glad to uh, take questions in the, the remaining, remaining time if, if anybody has any questions.
We even have a microphone, so you must speak to the microphone so everybody can hear. Hey, John. Hey. Um, Elliot Crow from Berkeley Lab. Yeah. Great presentation. Um, just to expand on the question of how long it takes and how hard it is to get all the data in, to get it to be trusted, I've heard some anecdotal examples of how long that might take, not just the connection, but feeling like you can really trust the data. I'm curious what you've seen in terms of expectations of how long that takes, and if it's a long time, is there a good way to kind of manage expectations with the people that really want to use the data once it's there? Great question. I'll try to address that, but only if you introduce yourself just a little bit more. <laughs> okay? I, I don't know what you need from me, but yeah, so I'm working for Berkeley Lab on energy analytics software. I'll be presenting tomorrow morning. Come see me. Um, do I need to say more than that? Okay. All right. Yeah, no, that's good. But been involved in a lot of the programs that are trying to, if I will, and correct me, prove the value independently of vendors, right, of doing this. And that's where your question comes from, which is, you know, how hard is it? How long does it take, right? And this is one of the big questions people have because one of the biggest problems is it's so variable, right? How long does it take? Hey, you get us, uh, you, you get a CSV file of your interval meter data from a utility company. Can you get that? Yeah, I can get that. How long is it going to take? Five minutes. Well, we can have meter data presentations and even convert it to greenhouse gas. I don't know. Ten minutes? Fifteen? Yeah, I want to have some coffee in the middle. Easy. Where the real issue comes up, I find, that, that causes this high variability is when they're trying to connect live, which we want to do. We want to do near real-time monitor-based commissioning. But you run into, what system do I connect to? What protocol does it support, right? And you might be able to answer those two questions, right, quickly. But one of the interesting things we've seen, and I know Alper, who, who's with us, who, uh, one, uh, I'm gonna relate a story you told me, okay, hopefully I'll get it right, is that you had proposed to get data from a system that was known, but you, the entire initial budget was burned up in conversations with the IT staff before you ever could connect. Your 40-hour estimate was gone, right? How do you factor that without starting the project? And that's what we find is a lot of people, they want to um, not fund any of the investigation part of how you're going to get to the data. And oftentimes that might be more work. Once Alpa got through that point with the IT department, it was connect, it was IP, it, IP address, it was password, I had the data. That took them three minutes. It took them two weeks of meetings to be able to connect. And so I think a lot of people um, think it's something hard about the data, and, and there are definite issues with all the different formats, but I would tell you that more of our support calls I would say, you know, if you know the word cloud thing, you know, which one do you hear the most? I would say the biggest word cloud late, lately is working through IT department to be able to get the data that is sitting there available. And that's why we often suggest people stop with the live connection as step one. Get some data, export it, right? They should be able to do that, right? And then prove the results you can get with that, which will help you justify going live. At least that's how I look at it. But to answer your direct question of how do you estimate that, that's part of project scope is to try to figure out what you're up against. You know, people say, oh, I got, pick a name, Johnson Controls Honeywell System. They've all had 100 different variations of systems in the last 20 years. Telling me you have Johnson Controls, that is not an answer to that question, right? I have Johnson Controls, Metasys, circa 2009 with no upgrades. And you know what, BACnet was on the brochure, but we actually didn't order that option. That's a real case where a customer discovered that. Alper, a question, but uh, microphone, microphone. No, I'm, uh, you oh, you. Uh, yeah, well, secure, you secure ways of communicating. There's a lot of different ways out there. Um, IT staffs are looking for things that follow industry standards. Web sockets is a, is a method of, of doing that. You know, we, we have a protocol that supports that. But you know what? If you, you're stuck with what can that end system do? Right. 
So I wish I had a better answer for you because it's actually one of the biggest barriers in our whole industry is getting the data. If you have the data, the other stuff comes fast, right? I mean, it's certainly the initial value comes fast, the charts, the graphs, the relationships. Then you can go into KPIs easily. It's getting the data. Of course, that's where Haystack comes in. Um, I know you guys have done studies around that, so yeah. Hi, good morning, John. Um, my name is Adam Williams. I'm with Sindoni Consulting. And, and a fairly fundamental question. Once you connect and start gathering data um, on a phased project, and that's what this specific question is, is about. I have a multi-phase project, as an example, where there might be three or four phases. And after phase one, I need, I, I'm, I'm commissioned, I've validated all the systems, um, and, and, and now we're collecting data. Great. Um, we're working on the next phase, and as we are done commissioning it and want to bring it online, how, how does SkySpark um, do auto discovery on subsequent phases without, um, I don't know if it's occupying physical addresses from the, from the initial um, phase. My, my question basically is doing auto discoveries or discoveries of, of IO and variables and set points um, how do we avoid uh, replicating points that were discovered in previous phases? Yeah, I don't think that, that part of it's a, a really big problem because when you, in, in our view, when, you know, the way we approach it, okay, um, and BACnet's a good example, right? But all of the protocols, all, the, this and other, they all have different discovery or learn features, right? So one protocol could work this way to learn it, and another one could work this way to learn it. So. So the first part of your question is which protocol? And a good example I'll give you is, anybody here work with Modbus? When you connect to Modbus, what do you get? Ones and zeros. That has absolutely no meaning unless you have what? The register map. And then you know what it is. Guess what the register map? It's a way to contextualize your data and lead to tagging, right? So if you're trying to dis discover Modbus devices, you get an IP address and you might have to log in or it might be wide open and you get ones and zeros and you get a, a register map. We, in our software, we have a place you can load the register map to map it against a piece of equipment. So like if you have 100 meters that are all the same register map, you can just attach it and you get data out of it. But when you do with BACnet, um, you're going to an IP address related to the device. So it's really, you know, that is not a common problem I ever hear about that people are worried they're rediscovering or adding others. The bigger problem is, do you have the ability to find the things? And how much data can you get from them? Because, you know, BACnet's been out there since late 90s, right? Early systems were very, uh, had very l serious limitations on how much data they could flow. And so we find uh, another example, projects where you know, we're in the modern world, it's an IT-oriented mentality, and they try to connect to a system that's heavily MSTP, and they think they're going to flow 10,000 points with one-second updates. No, you're not going to be able to flow that data up. And this gets into just like an expectation problem of can, what can that external, that target system deliver to me? Not necessarily easy to answer. I mean, you can say, okay, it's only 9,600 baud, but there may be other barriers in it. It may be the CPU processing. We've seen MSTP devices. You can't ask them for anything you know, more than once every five minutes, right? These are all of the unfortunate landmines that are out there in the physical world we're trying to connect to, right? And again, this is where I get to my point is, this has to be part of the paid scope of a project. I mean, this company, is, you know, I guess, you know, their business model might be to do it for free. But there is a cost associated with assessing these problems, right? So, okay. All right, anything else? How are we doing? You haven't flashed me the time. Oh, we had another question. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi, this is Javier Betancourt from Adeco Services and Installations. So, very quick question regarding the greenhouse emissions so yeah. that's a standard feature now in SkySpark that's just a so that's just a yeah it's so a, that's yeah, now it's available a, yeah it's a standard feature we, re, we released it to beta geez almost a year ago okay. it's been fully released since last fall yeah but so in the new and the new in the new version now yeah so, it's okay, always so. in there it's always in there yeah okay okay yeah 
Yeah, it's always in there. Um, in fact, in the last version, we added other online services. So the US has the EPA, eGrid. Australia has one. And I don't know, did, did, was there one out of Europe we were able to connect to? But not all the countries and regions have you know, online lookup. Some of them, you have to go get it and type it in to get your conversion factor. Um, so. All right, anything else? Okay. Go on, go on, go on. All right, thanks, everybody. Appreciate talking with you all. <laughs>